I think we kick off. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to see you. Nice, nice crowd here today. Um, so have you ever wondered why some concepts or products become successful while others don't? Has anyone wondered here, and this is probably a bigger wonder, what are we going to do with generative AI? If none of these topics ever interest you, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> but if they are, hang around. And if they're not, you know, please still hang around. So if this is of interest to you, let's, let's flesh this out over the next 30 to 40 minutes. <clears throat> My name is Martin Hickey, and I work over at IBM. Um, I've been working out in open source for the last 10 plus years. Before that, I've been, I've been doing more um, downstream work, working on products on top of it. And uh, yeah, I get a great kick out of open source, and it's great to have a company that supports me doing that. Donald? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Donald. I'm working with IBM for about three years. Previous to that, I was with Meta. And before that, I was back in education. And before that, working a long time in application development. And uh, currently, I'm the IBM product lead for the Cogniman Consortium, which is as if it's a European Commission project um, with an objective to generate um, tools for the open source community. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Donald. So how do you make sure the product you're going to put out there or the service you're going to put out there is going to be as successful as possible? And that's where design thinking using agile methodologies comes in. So a little bit about design thinking. There's four key pillars to design thinking, and they are clarity, ideation, development, and implementation. So clar clarity is standing back and observing what your product's going to do in an unbiased fashion. So really looking at all angles to it before you start developing. You know, looking at the problem, looking at what customers need, fleshing every bit of that out without coming up with, what, with set ideas off, off the cuff. The next thing then is the ideation phase, and that's brainstorming your, your, your solutions. You know, taking every solution into account because sometimes the solutions you don't think have the have the drive to get there are the ones that are 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 the ones that are the most successful in the end. So being open minded, trashing it out, working out where, where you think uh, the best solution is. The next part of that then is the development of some of these solutions and the testing of them. Seeing if, if the proof of concept will work. Seeing, uh, working with your clients or your users to see if any of these solutions are a runner. And then finally selecting one of those solutions and doing an implementation. During this implementation phase, you can be always feeding back into the loop, trying it out, making alterations here and there. But all through this, you're thinking of the bigger picture. You're thinking outside the box and you're looking to understand what your customers or users uh, need and how they're going to use your product or service. So here, here I put up some points around why design thinking matters. But what interests me the most is an article I read in the Harvard Business School. And hands up if you know all these products or companies up here. Yeah, if you don't know all of them, you probably, you probably know most of them. And if you get a chance to have a look at the article, it's really worth, really interesting to have a look at. So each one of these companies implemented design thinking in relation to their products. The first one is GE. So GE had a very, very successful MRI uh, machine. It was used in hospitals all over the place. It was top of the range. But they decided to implement 
design thinking around one, I suppose, small aspect that most people would maybe not think about, but if you have children, you would, that a high percentage of children got very upset or started crying when they were using an MRI machine. So they decided to implement it around user-centric uh, approach. How can we make this better? And through design thinking, they came up with a more child-friendly machine with nice kind of um, child-friendly images and so forth, not making it as kind of dark or as, as stark as, as the machine had been. And it was a huge success. Oral-B, who are famous for their um, electric toothbrushes, they, they got a company to do design thinking and their thoughts when they brought this company in was, you know what we need to do now? We need to put more functionality into our toothbrushes. Cost they thought themselves that their customers needed stuff like, you know, tracking how frequently they brushed their teeth, um, observing gun uh, sensitivity. You know, these are reasonable things and playing music while you brush your teeth. Now, most of us, if you're honest, you probably home a little tone when you're, when you're brushing the old uh, fake gloves, we call them in Irish, or your teeth. However, they found out when the design thinking company came in, this is not what users wanted. There's two things that users wanted were, number one, better ways of recharging your, your, your um, toothbrush. And number two was easier ways of getting replacements for the heads. Sounds really practical when you hear it, but you know, when they, they thought customers wanted more. I won't go through all of them. Uh, what's the last one I'd pick out here that's of interest? Um, Netflix, I'd say, for interest. So does, does everyone know where Netflix started off as competitors to blockbusters and, you know, DVD houses out there? That was their first business. And they, they did design thinking or they got, got a company design thinking to realize here that actually customers would prefer to be able to order the DVDs, they arrive at the house, use them and send them back rather than going to the shops. Then when DVD trade started dying, then they realized that streaming was the next, the next service that users wanted. So they've always been innovating. Uh, then they came up with short videos. People like short videos to know what's that movie about or what's that series about. So all these little things have worked on along. The other companies as well, Uber Eats and Airbnb have implemented for different things. Airbnb, it's been around that users found the pictures that, that uh, suppliers had of the accommodation weren't great. So they came up with more high profile um, cameras and Airbnb came where the drivers in, or in really dense urban areas couldn't find parking. So they came up with ways of better places for them to park and stuff. So I'm just going to show an example of how it works from a software perspective around starting with your customer and then how you go down to your team working on, on their uh, stories and stuff in an agile fashion. So the first of all is, I suppose, the design thinking phase, which is the big key part where your product owner goes out and talks to the business user or your users or the particular uh, customer you want to work with or client. And nothing will ever take away from that human interaction with a customer, finding requirements. Hands up here who's ever worked with clients and stuff getting uh, uh, business requirements or user requirements. Oh, you have a couple of hands. It's both exhilarating and it can be infuriating all at the one time. But it's absolutely fabulous when you start working with a customer and finding out what they want. And then when it goes fully into end to implementation and you provide that user or users or customers or clients with the key product that's needed. The next phase then is in the agile, uh, in the agile methodology is providing the epics. The next one here, is it? Yeah. So writing those epics, writing the high level type stories that are needed. What are the key characteristics that need to be implemented? Then the breakdown into stories. Writing the stories with the engineering team to know that what they have to do, what do they have to implement so that the product or service comes out is what the user wants. Hands up here who has ever worked on 
uh, product or project where the end product wasn't exactly what the customer needed or wanted. Ah, we have an honest bunch today, Donald. We're in, we're in good terms here. Because if anyone sat there and didn't put their hand up and pretended it never happened, well, then, you know, we're, we're, you're, you're, you're just lying to yourself in this one. It's, it's happened to everyone in every company somewhere. And knowing the implementation of the thing that's needed, it sounds the most obvious, doesn't always work that way. And, like, you know, not every, you can't blame, you know, one particular person in the chain or one particular group in the chain but you know if it doesn't come across what people need and what's to be implemented then the whole thing falls down so having that being able to trash those stories out so that the implementation team can or so that the engineering team can then implement what's required and that's where the key is at the end and that's where having that whole cycle of design thinking right through to writing the right epics and the stories so that people implement what's required rather than they think what is required. So for large companies in particular, they'll normally have a series of POs, PO, uh, teams that even work with, with, with customers and they'll have design thinking implemented and they'll have the resources and so forth to do this. But for smaller companies and startups, you know, there is a cost to this. There is, you know, skills that's required. And often, and I've worked in smaller companies and startups is, you may just have one uh, 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 PO. You may just have one product owner. And that product owner may be spread across different teams. So that's where design thinking sometimes falls on because the PO is stretched to the limit of what they're trying to do. And this is where I'm going to hand over to Donald where through his experience, he's looked at a way to complement the, the PO to help automate some of those tasks. Thanks, Thank you. So Mark is describing the current best practices for implementing design thinking in an agile scenario. The idea we're speaking about today had its origin in a situation where I was helping a team who were all newcomers to both agile and design thinking, organize a backlog of tasks for an MVP, which is a minimum viable product. We got the ball rolling by meeting in person at a central location where I facilitated three days of discussions. In this time, we didn't do too bad, actually. We got through about two or three epics with about five technical stories in each. That got me thinking, though. Is there a better way to do this? Is it a way to jumpstart the creation of the first versions of epics and stories to get a team working quickly? What we're about to demo to you today is a technique that does exactly that, an agentic AI system with two agent personas. Can I see a show of hands to anyone who has used Agentic AI before? Okay, so we have a few people, that's great. So I'll just jump into a, a, a quick explanation perhaps um, of AI agents. So AI agents could be said to be autonomous software with some perception of its environment that can make decisions and acts to achieve its goals in that environment. AI agents have been around a long time. In the era before large language models, agents were narrowly focused and task specific. They were designed for single well-defined roles, shoot your spaceship. Whether they were rule-based or, or used other techniques like reinforcement learning, they took time and expertise to create. And also, they weren't easily adaptable. If they were capable of learning, they learned through repetition and struggled with novelty and new scenarios. Large language models, however, are a game changer for the creation of AI agents because their generalized architectures make them easily adaptable to new tasks. They can be programmed with natural language, literally plain English. And for general tasks, you don't need to input a large amount of data as they've been pre-trained with a vast knowledge base in their development phase. So, in our system, humans in business and engineering teams will be assisted by two agent personas. One agent will help to condense business requirements into agile epics, and the other will help to create technical stories for epics for the engineering teams. Now, just to note that our system actually runs locally. The results we have obtained so far are of high enough quality not to have used more powerful models in the cloud, but they have been sanity tested. It has been run successfully using the open source 
Metatama 3.1 8-brand model on a MacBook Pro M1 Max with 32 gigabytes of unified memory. Why is running a model locally good? All your data stays locally. Another hat I wear in this project is that of a data architect. We're in the process of provisioning an Azure data fabric for the project. One of the key concerns here for a European project such as this is that of data tenancy. European data should stay in Europe where, where possible. Just also to note that the demo we're about to show you today has been written with three wonderful open source libraries, Olama, Chainlet and Langchain. Just coming in there, Donald. So where did this come about? So when, when you look at this and, and what, you've, what you're going to show here, uh, what made you come into looking at thinking about agents and so forth? So what we really wanted to do, I guess, so the, the, the consortium I'm working with, and I'll show that I have a slide on it later, is called the, the Cognium and Consortium. So what we do is we have, what we are is a, a group of 15 companies with about 90 different uh, researchers and engineers working on it kind of centred around four different projects. And for one of these projects, we were asked to help organise them. And like I said, we all met, we, we all met up and we, um, we, we, uh, we got the project refinement process going. However, it didn't really scale, it was slow. And, and then, but for, if it, in my opinion, it was a bit slow, but everyone was delighted. And they said, well, can you do it for the second project? And can you do it for the third project? And can you do it for the fourth project? And I went, no problem, help. So then I thought, why not? So the big thing here was that you were involved in doing all the requirements, the epics and so forth, because you were the, you were the people on this, the person on these teams that had that skill set. Exactly. That the so you were looking at the f fact of, how can I offload some of this work so that I can keep working with the clients and getting the requirements, but then generating things like epics and so forth, that workload can be taken up. 100%. We are, and we also have a, we're about to show now, and uh, we also have we've two new agents. So one, one is a, a product owner slash design thinker, and the second is a scrum master. And both of these help the processes in different in, at different stages. Okay. Um, so our first agent is the product owner design thinker, as I said, who will act as an assistant to the product owner. So the primary role of, of this uh, agent is to translate business user needs into clear technical requirements for the scrum team. It has been asked to focus exclusively on creating a high level list of technical epics for the minimum viable product of the software solution. Our second agent is the Scrum Master agent who will act as an assistant to the engineering team. So this is part of the vision of, if you can imagine. So, so in this, I was acting as a kind of a product owner proxy because I'm both an engineer, a PO and a Scrum Master as it happens. But in this case, I was the product owner. So this was a really, really useful tool for me to, to take and condense the user's requirements into, um, into starting skeletons for epics. Whereas this agent would more likely be used by the different engineering teams for each project. So they would, and, I, and we will demo it later, they would actually take the epics one by one and input it into the, um, the LLM agent and then generate uh, starting points for each of the stories. So just to recap there, so the first agent is going to be involved in taking the information you've got in design thinking with the customer and the requirements to generate the epics for you. Yes. And then the second agent is going to help with the engineering team where it'll take the epics and help to trash out some stories so that it helps the team get off the ground faster and get going. Exactly, exactly. And it's about enabling the team because every time it will show good examples of what well-formed stories should be. Right? And it's what is crucial to this, and anyone who's worked in Agile or Scrum or even in, in, in well-organized teams knows that if you take away agency from an engineering team, and if you're imposing things on an engineering team, there's no better way to make people cross and angry, right? If you're just simply dictating. Whereas if you have an expert who's sitting there waiting to help all the time, which, which understands natively what a well-formed story looks like, then you're already at an advantage, particularly for newcomers. So the Scrum Master agent just quickly um, is tasked with creating three to five user stories for each high level technical epic provided by the product owner for a software solution. It has been asked to write a clear and detailed description and to, find, and to define specific acceptance criteria. It has several guidelines, I won't go through them all, but chief amongst them are use clear accessible language 
and apply your technical expertise to ensure feasibility and best practices. What better mentor to have? So now we'll go through the step-by-step -step process. So this is the enhanced process. Um, Martin showed the kind of the, uh, the current, I guess, state of, state of play. And here's where we introduce the two um, LNM agents. So what you're showing here is, is you've seen the agents taking some of the workload off the uh, PO and helping the team as well, enhancing the team. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. When it's summoned, the first thing the design thinker agent is going to do is to ask about details for the software project for which it should create epics. Step one is about providing those detailed instructions in collaboration with the business owner. So there is no substitute, unfortunately, for still talking to your business owner. <laughs> you still need to understand the requirements in as much detail as possible. A huge part of design thinking is having empathy for the user. It's as important to know what the user cares about as what they really don't care about. Because as engineers, I know me as an engineer, as Martin said, you make assumptions. And and frequently, design thinking is about validating and invalidating assumptions. Okay? Similar to what Martin described, but instead of writing the epics himself, so step one is about providing those detailed instructions in collaboration with the business owner to prompt the design thinker agent to generate epics. Similar to what Martin described, but instead of writing the epics themselves, they will use the agent to assist them. No writer's block, no more excuses. The product owner then passes these instructions to the design thinker agent and validates the responses. So literally, you pass the, the requirements in a succinct prompt to the agent, the agent writes the epics, and you sanity check them as a human. There's always a human at the wheel. Next, the engineering team refine the epics and ask the product owner for clarifications if, ne if necessary. This is the same process as before. But now, we're, now the, the PO has help in this case. So you have a validation, you have a validation phase on this mm -hmm. where we, you know, we're not going to blindly trust the LLM because you know, everyone knows LLM gives you the right answer every time. <laughs> Anyone uh, who's a teacher will know that laugh because they know the answer that comes out from kids that use LLM. So. Yeah. yeah, one huge part actually of, of anyone who's used LLM is the stochastic nature of their responses, right? So you are not going, so the, the starting prompts of these agents have been engineered as such as to minimise the randomness. The temperature, that, is anyone familiar with the temperature of a model is? So the temperature of this is set to one. So literally, nearly, if we could set it lower, I would, right? So it, it's to minimise the, uh, let's say, creativity of the model at the other end, right? Once the engineering team are happy with their understanding of the ethics, a team member asked the Scrum Master agent to help them start to write the stories. The team, now, it's, so, it's, so you, you're not getting complete stories in this, you're getting kind of, it, it's, it's actually like a relationship where the LLM is prompting the humans, right? So it's a symbiotic relationship here. The team take these starting skeletons and begin to flesh them out into actionable tasks. Once the team are happy with the stories, the product owner can then ask the design thinker again, the design thinker agent to review them once again. Now that's a similar process again. So a good product owner, more often than not, so when I've worked as a product owner, obviously I have an engineering background, and I talk to the business user, I provide the epics to the, the Kanban or Scrum team, the team refine them, and then they come up with suggested, suggested um, stories, say to action, the, the, um, the objective of the epic. So that's the exact same step, but again, the product owner is assisted by the agent. So next we're going to show you a quick demo. Okay. So what you're going to demo here, and you, you're going to, John is going to describe the real, real world example here, how this has come about, and uh, what they've been trying to do uh, with different manufacturers. But the flow he showed there is, is generally you know, even though it was nice and cartoonish, and I liked it, Derek, I was actually, I don't know where he did him, he wouldn't tell me, uh, is it shows a nice overview of how it flow. And probably most people here, if you've been through going from users right through to the final product coming out or service, you know that flow already. And the last number of years is with design method methodologies in the last 10 plus years has helped an awful lot with that and the interaction. So hands up here, who's went through the waterfall process in, in, in previous times? People are a bit shy to give away their ages, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like everything. 
bad waterfall is the same as bad um, agile methodologies. You know, it's just the way it goes. Okay, Donald, show us what you have, my friend. Now, before I jump into the demo, I'll just explain the business context for which I generated it starting from. So that's important because otherwise it would be gibberish, right? So it's kind of um, it's important to understand, I guess. Our business owners, ABS, operate a steel manufacturing plant in Udine, in Italy. Steel arrives by train and is deposited in their stock park and is registered in, the, in their SAP system. The SAP system knows about which stack in the park the steel is located, but not its location in the stack. For example, top, middle, bottom, or whether it's easy or hard for the forklift, op forklift operator to retrieve. Our system, when, when completed, will pilot a drone around the yard to acquire, acquire pictures of the QR codes at the end of the steel bars and update the SAP system with this information. This will really help when the logistics operators need to fulfill the orders for the steel plant. Okay, so we'll just jump out of this now. And You're just going to show the demo here. Show the demo. Yeah. Did you... You a rain dance to the demo gods or anything? Oh, yeah, no, you did not. Taking absolutely no chances. I see a bit of nervousness in your voice there. <laughs> Don't be nervous. You might want to go full screen though. I might want to go full screen indeed. Look at there that. you go. Fantastic. So here we see a starting prompt initialized, and that just that's a that's a deterministic starting prompt. So this is a video. Is it a recording? This is most definitely a recording. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just just in case <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, wondering, yeah. if he was to do this live, we'd be here. Till yeah, next we'd week, be here. We'd so. be here till uh, next yeah. week. Um, so if we kick off, um, I have a series of prompts to which I I um, receive optimal responses which I will enter into the system. So this so prompt is, is where you're inferencing the model, isn't it? Exactly. So, so you're giving it the if you don't know what a prompt is, exactly, it's the yeah. command that you're given to the model in a certain way so it'll give you an answer back. Uh, otherwise, you know, the answer could be very random. Exactly. Um, so as part of the starting prompt for this agent, it's been told to be polite. It's told to be helpful and it's told to accept feedback. So Immediately, it goes straight straight on topic, and it asks. Um, it, it it confirms that it would be happy to help build a high level list of technical epics for the MVP, and then it asks for details. Right. So next, I supply those details, and again, just reiterate, this is the output of the process between the product owner and the um, and the business user. So I'll just pause it there quickly. So the actual, the nature of this prompt is actually quite important because again, this, this, there was a quite a lot of um, craft involved in this because like I said, it's a relatively small model. It runs locally for data tenancy reasons. So what we were trying to do is trying to give it as much detail as it possibly could, um, given a design thinking mindset, right? So it has been initialized with design thinking, right? One thing I should, I should say as well, we didn't need to use a rag, for example. Does everyone know what a rag is? Okay, we didn't need to use a rag for this. The, the training data that the model was trained in was sufficient to give it enough understanding to become effective as a design thinker. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty revolutionary to me. That was incredible, it was just out of the box. It was amazing. So again, like I said, the actual, the composition of this um, starting prompt from the product owner and business user is actually quite important. So it starts with an I am statement, okay, as you would see in a lot of agile stories. And it says, I am a log logistics manager in a steel manufacturing plant, responsible for the optimization and fulfillment of external customer orders for finished steel products. I will not read everything out, right? It lists a set of key responsibilities. Um, these include order processing, inventory management, driver coordination, Strong technology integration, data analysis, rule optimization, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there are, I believe, next is yes, constraints and considerations. Again, the current ERP system provides only stack level in location information, and so on and so forth. And my, object, my objectives are so what you have is considerations, objectives, and current role. 
and we go. And it did a week's work in a couple of, a couple of seconds, right? <laughs> so when I showed this to the team after, now I, I, I had developed it a couple of weeks after we did it, after we all met together, there was a kind of, there was a silence, right? And it's kind of, it's like a combination of wonder and horror. <laughs> Like, in some respects, we're going to have to justify not using a system like this in the future, right? That's just the way the world has changed now, right? And remember, folks, again, this is out of the box, pretty much. Okay. Not to scare anyone, though, and what, what you're doing here is that, you know, because these models are trained and so much data around there, it doesn't need any domain-specific knowledge because what you're asking it to do is take a serious requirement and generate ethics from it. So it will have that knowledge around design methodology and it's just automated in a series of steps uh -huh. that, you know, if the PO is really, really stressed or, or, or under pressure, this adds an extra workload. Whereas they're still going doing the important stuff. Which Absolutely, is and there, there's no substitute. And throughout our research on the Cognitive Mind Consortium, a huge component of it is human-machine interaction. And one, and one of the main aspects of that is all these agents and systems are attended. As in, that means they all have users, they're not autonomous, they don't act on their own, okay? Because the output is, by its nature, stochastic, and we need a validation of that. However, as starting prompts for humans, these are pretty effective, I think. Okay, so now we're gonna switch, switch tack quickly over to, imagine it's the engineering team who are using the Scrum Master Agent, right? So they both run locally, very light memory footprint. And they're running using Olama as, as a runtime, so. Yeah. You know, if you know the LAMA framework, you know, VLLM, different, there are different types of runtime frameworks for running your models uh, so you can call the model. Because the model needs to be running somewhere for you to be able to inference it or call it. Okay. So again, the second agent is prompted to be friendly, helpful, accept feedback, um, and is hyper-focused on what it's going to deliver as well. So again, we just say hello, we say what we want to do today, and then it replies it responds in how it, how it can help. So what we're going to do here then is um, feed in one of these epics. So what I'm doing is I'm copying and pasting over and back. So there's an obvious optimization here, right? We could output the epics as, as in, in whatever format you like, um, JSON, and then pass it over to the, to the Scrum team as well. But I kind of purposely want to put it into the human workflow here as well. And Chainlit, Donald, is, is that an AI assistant or, or what is it? Chainlit is pretty much the front end. So I, did, I could have done all this on the on a, on a console. Yeah. But so Chainlit would be like an AI assistant. You know, you'd have uh, Continue, which is an extension in, in, um, in VS Code. Yes. Where you put in the content into it and it can connect to a backend server which in this situation is a llama to connect to the particular model you want. So that's what that's providing you, isn't it? That exactly. abstraction. Exactly. Yeah. So right. Chainlit is how you stick all this stuff together. Okay. Right? Um, and again, I have used the lightest, this is the lightest possible implementation of Chainlit here. So it's literally just with the starting prompt and uh, setting the temperature at the model, right? But like you said, it, the, the obvious optimization is to make this part um, automated. So as you can see, that was kind of quick, uh, coming up with stories. Right? And again, consider a situation where we have novices. Like, this is, this is a wonderful starting point for a team of novices to, to, to get going. So, am I out of time? Okay. So pretty much, I, thi I think all I do next is I, I actually get a second epic just to, just to prove it wasn't a fluke. Um, uh, they all, so I, I'm just kind of going up and down here. So if you remember the business case, these are all still coherent. They still, they still make sense. So you're feeding in each epic at each time to generate exactly. the user story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we can skip ahead. I think I, I yeah. Oh, I'll go back there, I missed, I missed the magic. So I, I, I copy a second epic and I paste it in here. I just want to pause that there. No, can we see here actually? These three back ticks here. The performance, I don't know, has anyone else come across this when you're prompting? If you're giving an example, say a string that you want to rephrase or something you want the agent to act upon, it's really good idea to demark it with either back ticks or tags. Okay. 
tour again. Second, second floor as well. Like I said, wonder. <laughs> right. So we would get there as humans. We just wouldn't get there as fast. But we, ha we have to make sure that we don't overtake, overtake each other on the road either. Because it would be very easy. So part of the HMI work on the project is to make sure we're bringing humans with us as well. Right? HMI being human machine interface. OK, so this bit, I'm going to skip forward again. But this is the, the PO, the product owner, going back with a story to the, to the to design thinker agent and saying, is this on topic? And we see it actually goes through line by line, and then without having to be asked, rewrites the story for me. Now, the team can decide to take it or not, you know, it, 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 it's, it's the same idea. So that's the end of that demo there. Um, very quickly, I'm going to jump back onto the, the slideshow that Martin back in. Um, Just kill it. I hate sc screen sharing. Oh, oh man, <laughs> can't believe we did it. Uh, um, got there. So just very quickly, um, I want to give a shout out to Cognomant. So we're an open source European Commission project. Um, Cognomant stands for Cognitive Industries for Smart Manufacturing. It's led by NORS, the uh, Norwegian Research Institute, and its objective are to um, promote uh, cognitive technologies such as AI, digital twins and robotics in open source toolboxes and repositories. Right. That's all I got. I thought, thought that was very good. Thank you, Donald. Um, so just wrap up, folks. Um, I think we'd all agree if you have been through the process of working with customers or trying to get a product out the door, that sometimes when you've tripped up on a product, having a real understanding of how what a customer wants or a customer needs is so important. And one of the examples I talked earlier was around Oral-B, who you'd expect would know their toothbrushes from one end of the brush to the other. When they taught what the customers needed, it wasn't what customers wanted. And having implement or employing a design thinking team to go out and find exactly what the customers wanted was so important. And when you look at things afterwards, how simple they are, you know, it's because companies have spent their time working it out. And if you've worked on products where you've got to the end of a cycle and after doing a series of implementation and you realise what it, wa it wasn't what was needed, it's really infuriating. But this can be quite challenging for smaller companies, startups or SMEs because of you may not have the resources to have multiple POs or multiple people trained in design thinking. So an ability to be able to automate some aspects of it especially around the generation of epics and stories, because you know that takes time. And once your skeletons are, are fleshed out versions of it, you can always feed back in and review on it. So I think Dolan has really shown here from, you know, a real, a real life example where he's been working in a group, you know, on the ground and realizing that, can I use my AI knowledge? Because he, he, he has a lot of expertise in uh, data science, etc., and he, he needs to get out of the lab, so it's good to see him <laughs> out into the real world. Uh, sorry if any data scientists are here and they get upset by that. Uh, but on a serious note, to, to show where he saw something, he saw an opportunity and said, right, okay, can I use uh, generative AI large language models and can I use Agentic to do something very practically uh, to enable us when we do our jobs? So. Thank you very much. So, questions? We have. So, yeah. Awesome. And then, like, same as you, like, generate epics, generate, like, all the actionable items, yeah. and then even database schema, all that kind of stuff. Right. But, like, I kind of feel one challenge I'm encountering is if you just let LM do everything, right. then you will, like, have the, the 
exact problem you just mentioned. You abuse something the user doesn't want. Exactly. Like not exactly what user want, or even not exactly what you want him yeah. to do. And uh, I don't really like believe in a world where agents just take over and replace human completely. I believe in a world where agents and humans work together, like agents are uh, taking the feedback from human. But I, I can't believe that's the really hard challenge yeah. with all of the tools, like cursor, rapidly. Like they can do this thing quickly, but how do I let it like give feedback to it? Yes. Like in a good UI UX design. Like that, that's just like a really hard thing I'm struggling with. Someone said to me there a while ago, we just were witnessing the end of the golden age of human generated content. Right? <laughs> That's kind of sobering, right? So what models are going to be trained on now going forward is frankly more likely to be machine generated. Which is really, really suboptimal, right? Because what we value in the models is their creativity and their leaps forward. But that's a human trait and a human insight. This simple little demo here can prove with a very small model, relatively speaking, just shows what the potential of what you can do. When you, imagine if you had an expert in the room. Right? We've all had the, the impossible task. Right? We've all been, they go, oh God, I, I, I was working with somebody who knew this. Right? Well, now we are. Right? The thing about it is, and, and what you're saying as well, is which, again, is, is brilliant because it's an optimization going forward. So if you can imagine this as a, as a, a moving cursor over time, right? You generate your stories. Those stories are refined. Sorry, your epics and stories are refined. If you can save the output of the model, right, and then compare it, and then so this starts as a zero shot model, which is basically you just you just rock up and you give it you give it a prompt and you depend on its reasoning ability and the data which it's been trained on. But if you had a local pipeline working there, you could start with a, um, a few shot pipeline. You say you gave me this story. This is what the story turned out to be. The reason why the two changed, right? This, this, we, we finished this story. It's to actually give a progress across time of what we've actually finished. So the new epics it would generate, or based, it would base, be based on its understanding of what has already been completed, right? So, and that again in Cognomen is something we're looking after as well, which is that we have a, a, we're working with a team of researchers in Rome, actually, whose sole focus is making these ethical and safe and usable. With you for humans. So thank you very much for that question. That's a, that's a great question. Okay, folks, uh, we'll be out in the hallway if you want to have a chat because uh, we're just over time, I think. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, guys.